If you remember the Yule Ball dance minigame, Harry strutting around Hogwarts, and Hermione lecturing the party during battle, then you grew up playing Harry Potter. But which one? Because there were 15 different handheld games, and in this video we're going to rank all of them. Okay, so we've compared every Harry Potter tie-in game. Then, 5,000 of you voted for your favourite console Harry Potter game. And now it's time to rank the handheld games. Once again, thank you all for voting. This poll received 2,000 votes and hundreds of comments comments, and I will be featuring some of them during this countdown. In the meantime, we will start at the bottom of the list. Coming in at number 15, we have The Order of the Phoenix for the Game Boy Advance. Now, on the surface, a Resident Evil-style Harry Potter game with a fixed camera and pre-rendered backgrounds sounds like it would be interesting. However, this was not the case, and I think Seriously Lemon nailed it with his comment. The design of Order of the Phoenix just does not work on the Game Boy Advance. The atmosphere and ambience that made the console versions of the game really excellent are gone, and the music is severely downgraded. There aren't as many NPCs and the spellcasting minigames I would argue are worse than the analog stick wiggling, and a lot of areas are locked off while you're completing missions for no reason. Okay, at number 14 we have the Hubblood Prince for the PlayStation Portable. Now this game takes everything that's bad about the Game Boy version of the Order of the Phoenix and ports it to the PSP. The game is pretty much an end collection of fetch quests occasionally interrupted by an awkward sideways duel. Finish her. At number 13 we have the Deathly Hallows Part 1 for the Nintendo DS. This one was definitely an improvement over the last two, however there really isn't anything that sets it apart from the pack. The cutscenes are faithful to the source material but the touch only controls are a bit annoying. I think the most memorable thing about this one is the Nagini sock puppet transformation. At number 12 we have the Goblet of Fire for the PSP. Now I was actually quite surprised when I saw this this one so low down the list, as this game is almost a one-to-one -one copy of the console version. It even had multiplayer with game sharing for friends who didn't own a copy of the game. To be fair, the console version of Goblet of Fire is pretty bad, so perhaps that's why it was so low down the list. Or it could have just been the fact that the PlayStation Portable had a much smaller install base compared to the two Nintendo handhelds, and so less people got to play this specific version. At number 11 we have the Deathly Hallows Part 2 for the Nintendo DS. So this game takes the first part and improves it in every way, better graphics, controls and level design. Although these Zelda-esque dungeons do tend to get a bit repetitive towards the end. But hey, at least we got Ron and Hermione taking on the Master Hand from Smash Bros. At number 10 we have the Nintendo DS version of Hubblood Prince. This is another interesting one because this version is almost identical to the PSP game which is so low down the list. In fact, the reason the PSP game seems like such a downgrade is because it started off life as a DS game and then just ended up being ported to the PSP. I guess the touch controls made all the difference. Okay, we're going to do these next two together. At number 9 and number 8 we have Goblet of Fire for the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS. And despite being much smaller in scope than the PSP version, a lot more people voted for these games. And and I can't seem to find a specific reason for it. Some fans like the touchscreen battles, some like the Niffler mini game, and others just like it because it was the first game they ever played. Boy, that makes me feel old. I'm just surprised nobody mentioned the dancing mini game. Okay, moving on, we have another pair. Coming in at number 7 and 6, we have the Order of the Phoenix for the PlayStation Portable and Nintendo DS. And once again, we see the Goblet of Fire trend repeat itself. The PSP version was as close to the consoles as they could get with the hardware limitations. Meanwhile, the DS version was mainly just an upgraded port of the GBA game. You know, the one that came in last place. And yet, the DS version had 10 more votes. I dug through the comments to try and understand understand why and found this one from Quickman26. After getting the game alongside the DS Lite for my 8th birthday, I spent so much of my time exploring the castle, dueling and brewing potions with better controls than the console version. Oh, and I could play Quidditch on the go which turns out was only in this version of the game. And so it seems like all these little refinements on the GBA version really made a difference. Also the uh, Quidditch minigame on the DS version? That was a straight up port of the Quidditch 
World Cup game for the GBA. Okay, coming in at number 5, we have the Philosopher's Stone for the Game Boy Advance. Now, this one isn't exactly a fantastic game. You know, there's a lot of barrels you're going to be pushing and you're occasionally going to be falling through the floor. But it kind of hits all the marks for an early Harry Potter game. It's got Quidditch, Spell Mini Games, and Quirrell's Evil Turban has his own dialogue icon. I suspect this game was ranked so high due to nostalgia as it was probably the first Harry Potter handheld outing for many of us. Also, Midnight pointed out that you could actually cast spells at other students in this one and they had a wide variety of different reactions. Moving on, at number 4 we have the Chamber of Secrets for the Game Boy Advance. This is another platform and this time isometric. Now, I'll be honest, my memories of this game mainly consist of chasing Hedwig through these trippy levels while she crapped out beams, but others seem to have more um, constructive memories of this game, like Alice who wrote, using spells in the dark corridors late at night and finding beans whilst it's midnight and you're supposed to be asleep and listening to the sweet sweet soundtrack, the whole game was just amazing in every way. Okay we're down to the final three and in third place we have the Philosopher's Stone for the Game Boy Color. Okay so the GBA version of Philosopher's Stone was pretty much a by the book handheld platformer. Now the Game Boy Color developers, Gryptonite Games, decided to go in the complete opposite direction and make an old school turn based RPG in the style of Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest and they did a pretty good job. The game had decent battle mechanics and the character animations were really fluid, especially for a Game Boy Color game. This one really follows the book closely however the art style is really trippy. Hogwarts is filled with weird statues of gnomes and cowboys, there's a giant bubble in one of the rooms and the corridors are filled with paintings of scientists with beakers. Now obviously the reason for this is because the game was being developed alongside the first movie. So the game developers didn't really have a lot of assets from the movie to base the game's art direction on and it seems like they just read the books and then used their own imagination to build the game. I think Franey's comment really nails it, describing it as kind of the last look at a world where people's mental images of Hogwarts were their own and not influenced by the movies. Moving on at number 2 we have the Chamber of Secrets for the Game Boy Color. Who would have thought that a game released in 2002 for the Game Boy Color would come so high? In fact this was the last proper Game Boy Color game to be released in the West. Well I think the community has proven that old does not mean obsolete. And so Griptonite Games returned as developer, they took the first Game Boy RPG and built on it. More enemies, multiple party members, more secrets, more mini games, more cool sprite animations and a great 8-bit soundtrack. This time around the aesthetics are a bit closer to the movies, although a few of the odd statues and paintings make a return. Look, even if you take away the Harry Potter license, this game would still be a great RPG for beginners in its own right. And so we come to the final game. In first place, making it the fandom's favourite handheld Harry Potter game is the Prisoner of Azkaban for the Game Boy Advance. So for the final game in their RPG trilogy, Gryptonite graduated to the Game Boy Advance. And and the developers really made full use of the newer system. The graphics were fantastic, retaining the stylized design and fluid animations while bringing them closer to the movies. The turn-based combat system was also redesigned in the style of the Pokemon and Golden Sun games and offered greater depth. And just like its predecessor, the game was packed with mini-games, secrets and areas to explore. Matthew P describes the Prisoner of Azkaban for the GBA as the result of polishing a gem until it shines. And so there we have it, the Harry Potter games ranked. I think most of us expected for one of the RPG games to take first place, but I think some of the positions lower down are quite unexpected. Just like last time, I made a tier list to help group the games which were close in votes. Please let me know if you agree with the rankings and the tier list in the comments. And thank you all so much for supporting my content. This is going to be the last Harry Potter video until Hogwarts Legacy, so I... Hold on, what's that? Oh, it's a swarm of comments asking why 
I haven't covered the Quidditch World Cup game. Okay, I, I guess I'll have to do that one. Oh, and uh, right next to it is another swarm asking for the Lego games. Okay, but if I do the Lego Harry Potter games, then I've got to do the Lego Star Wars games. And if I do those, then I've got to do the other Star Wars games I wanted to do. Plus, all the other games people have been asking for. Well, I know what I'm doing for the next year. And if you'd like to see more Wizarding World content from me, then please check out my second channel, AI Storytime, where I attempt to retell famous movies with AI-generated images, and I have a video on the first Harry Potter. As always, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow me on Twitter. See you next time.